Judges 16 and 1. Now Samson, now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went in to her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, whoo. That's what it looks like when God empowers somebody to do something. You can do incredible things. But in just these very few verses, we haven't read much yet. In these very few verses, we get to see Samson's incredible strength contrasted against his incredible weakness. All in one little splotch right there. <laughs> he could rip up city gates, but he was so easily seduced by women. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And so the Philistines, uh, the ones that Samson hadn't killed yet, <laughs> those Philistines, uh, they're out for blood. They're out for blood over all those thousands of the thousand Philistines that he has killed. So they think this is a good time to catch him. We're going to catch him while he's in a bad spot. We're going to catch him while he's in sin. Israelites know they ought to not be playing with harlots like this. They think they've got the advantage on him. So they're going to catch him by surprise. But instead, I think Samson caught them by surprise by pulling up the city gate and carrying it away. <laughs> uh, who's getting surprised here? <laughs> the Philistines are. Show the picture of that gate. He pulled up the entire city gate. He plucked it up like a flower. Now, you notice the text says nothing about any Philistines trying to attack him as he carried this gate away, because I'm inclined to think nobody dared try to, not after seeing that. I, I, I'm not going after him, <laughs> not after what I just saw. And another thing, city gates weighed a lot. They were heavy. They had to be super strong because they would close the gates at night to hold off enemy attack. They had to be strong. And now it doesn't say that Samson just picked up the gate. It says he also pulled up the gate posts. These gate posts were huge and they would have been sunk way down in the ground. He just ripped them up. And he also car carried the bar that crossed the gate to lock it shut, the whole thing. Now I got to looking at gates, city gates of that time, and it depends on the size of the gate or the wall or the city. But those gates, all the wood and the metal and everything that was in it, those gates weighed probably over five tons, possibly up to 10 tons. And this is one guy pulled it up and carried it off. This is what God can do through his people. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he may not enable you to do strength like that, but he can, do, he can strengthen you just the same for great things that are, you would think are impossible, that other people would think are impossible. I, trust me, it's impossible but godly possible that I'm even standing here as a pastor. Because there was once a time in my life when I said, I will never set foot in a church ever again as long as I live. Never. Look what I'm doing right now. Okay. I'm just saying, Samson carrying a gate, me doing this. It's all great stuff. <laughs> There's power in that. That's, this is a man uh, operating under the power of the Spirit of the Lord here. And so, I seriously doubt that Samson just walked away because the Philistines were just asleep. Who is going to attack a guy carrying a five-ton gate? Nobody. I sure wouldn't. I wouldn't even do it with all y'all helping me. It's not going to happen. So what we see here is that God has the power to protect his people for the purpose of accomplishing his will. And now that includes you. God can protect me for accomplishing his will. We do things that people don't like. We go pray at Planned Parenthood. We go and do various things that people don't like. They're mad at us for it. Don't worry about them. You do what God told you to do. He can, he can protect you for doing his will. Now, I want you to take comfort in this for yourselves, that if you're his, if you're truly his, you've really given yourself to God. If you will walk in his power, God can keep the enemy off your back if you're going to do his work for his will. Isn't that good? I don't have to worry about what people are. I can't tell you how many people told me, no, Ray, you can't be a pastor. I tried it and it didn't work. It won't work for you either. I've had dozens of people tell me that. 
That's very discouraging. I had to finally learn to stop listening to the enemy and do what God tells me to do, walk in his power. So by now you must be really shocked at Samson ripping this gate up like this. But Samson didn't just carry the gate a few steps and throw it down, did he? Okay, you know, 50 steps, that's good. Where does it say he carried the gate to? Verse 3, it says he carried it to Hebron. Where did Samson pull the gate up at? He pulled it up in Gaza. So how far away is Hebron from Gaza? Show the map. Hebron is 40 miles east of Gaza. 40 miles. I think the, the, the day of a good, good journey, a let's book it and let's get it done journey that people could, healthy people could accomplish in that day was about maybe 25 miles if they really worked on it. He carried this thing 40 miles east of Gaza. And so he, it says he carried it 40 miles to Hebron to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, friends, God's word is trying to show us that a flawed, messed up human being like Samson is capable of doing great things when God's power is upon them. Because I'm telling you, I have messed up like Samson has messed up. I, he was just sleeping with a harlot. Well, God can't use him. Yes, he did. So I want you to take this for yourselves and think of all the mistakes you made and all the sins you made where the enemy says, no, you can't do that. Remember what you did. Remember what you did. You can't, God can't use you. You messed up too bad. Don't listen to that. You can. God can use you for great things still. This is quite a contrast we see going on already with Samson. One minute he's sleeping with a harlot. Next minute he's pulling up gates and he's walking off with it. God's using him. Now, this is not a license to sin, but what I'm saying is God uses sinners. I am a sinner. I'm a forgiven sinner, but I'm a sinner. So anyway, now that we're impressed with this incredible display of strength, let me add another layer on top of it. Why did he do this? <laughs> What's the point? Look how strong I am. Not just that. Why did he do this? I mean, you don't do something this big for nothing. There's a point to it. If you're going to carry a city gate really far like that, there better be some really significant reason why. So first off, the destination. What is so spe special about Hebron? Hebron is one of the six refuge cities that God established. He told Israel. He told Moses. Moses died. He had Joshua set it up. When you get into land, set up six cities, spread them out around so that the avenger of death, if somebody kills somebody and the avenger comes after you, you can flee to a Hebron city, plead your case, they'll let you in, and you can stay there protected. That's what refuge cities were for. And so you have here that Samson had just killed in the previous chapter, he had just killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey because they murdered his wife and father-in-law. But do you remember what he said before he, he killed the thousand Philistines? He said in Judges 15 and verse 3, Samson said to them, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. They just killed his wife and father-in-law. He's mad. Jawbone of a donkey, he slayed a thousand guys. And he says, this time, whatever I do, I'm blameless of it because of what they did. So now he's carrying this big gate to a refuge city. Oh, I see it's starting to take shape here. So remember, here in Judges 16, the Philistines, they are waiting outside. Remember, they showed up at night. They are waiting as what? As avengers of blood. They want to kill him. And so the spirit, I believe, woke Samson up at midnight and ha has him show them what it looks like when God's power flows through his people. But also to carry the gate to Hebron, a place of refuge, was to show everyone that he is blameless of the deaths of the Philistines he killed. He said, I'm blameless this time. And he's carrying a Philistine gate to a Hebron, to, to a refuge city in Hebron to demonstrate, I'm blameless of this. I'm going to be protected. I'm under God's refuge. Nobody's touching him. He's under God's protection and strength the whole journey. Friends, I want to tell you, we've all sinned. We've all provoked God's wrath, and he's angry. But if you will get in his refuge, Lord Jesus, under the blood of Jesus Christ, he will protect you all the way through the journey of your life. Look at what Samson's showing us here. It's not just to carry a gate. Look how strong I am. There's a point to it. 
carrying this Philistine gate through 40 miles of Philistine-occupied territory to Hebron is a tremendous display of power that shows that God is going to execute great judgment against the Philistines because Samson is using this strength to do this against the Philistines. He's going to execute judgment against the Philistines, and he's going to protect the Israelites, and that there's no blame they can cast on Samson to stop it. You can't stop it. Judgment's coming, or you're going to be protected. Which one are you? (laughs) Right now's a good time to get right with Jesus if you're not. Judgment is coming, but God also offers you protection if you get under the refuge of Christ. Where do you stand? Get right with the Lord. And so that's why Samson, that's what Samson did to speak to the enemy at that time by carrying this gate. It it was showing them, you can't stop this. This is God's power. I'm blameless. I'm going to refuge, but you've got judgment coming. That's what this is kind of indicating. But also, um, I like to look at the prophetic, and it really concerns me that a lot of Christians say, I don't really care about prophecy. When God's Word says that uh, prophecy is, 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 is definitely in related with Jesus Christ, it's, it's like the same. It, it's, it's hugely important. If you don't care about prophecy, you can't understand 1% of what's in the Bible. So I, I want to show you a prophetic element in this. I don't think Samson may have known this, but the Holy Spirit was enabling him to do this. But, uh, but this show of strength here prepares the way for King David, who 100 years later would eventually complete Israel's full deliver- deliverance from Philistine oppression. David was going to come in and pick up from where Samson's leaving off by running the attack against the Philistines. Now, how is this going to work? Because How did I relate this to David? Because it is in Hebron, where Samson is carrying the gate to. It is in Hebron, where David first made his headquarters before moving to Jerusalem. This is, this is, we're not having this Philistine oppression no more. Samson, God's man, he's starting the conflict. Remember in Judges, it says God was looking for an occasion against the Philistines. So here's Samson stirring it up. He rips up the gate. He carries it to Hebron. To the place of refuge, which is going to be where David picks up a hundred years later and finishes the rest of the Philistine oppression to break it. Look at the picture. Wow, this is prophetic stuff. I want to show you where it talks about Hebron with David. 2 Samuel 2 and 1. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, and Nabal, the Carmelite. And David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household. So they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Hebron is hugely important in this story we're in. Now, there's a, a one-century gap, a hundred years gap between Samson time and David, but they're, they're working for the same deal here. They're working to break the oppression of the Philistines because the king is coming. The king is coming. Messiah Jesus is coming eventually to sit on that same throne. It hadn't happened yet. We're looking forward to it. He's going to sit on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The king is coming, but the oppression has to be broken. Friends, I want to ask you, are you living under oppression? Are you giving yourself over to sin? Does sin own your life? That oppression needs to be broken, and you need to get out from under it because the king is coming. This is prophecy here. So good. So he was anointed as King David in Hebron. The guy that came on the scene by slaying the Philistines' champion Goliath. Now, God used Samson to start the breakdown of Philistine oppression. But then he's going to use David to finish it off. Now, friends, I just want us to see this prophetic content and why Samson carried the gate to Hebron. You know, when you read in the Bible that says somebody did something, don't just go, oh, cool, he did that. Dig. Dig down. Don't be a lightweight. Dig down. (laughs) See what's going on. Why did he do this? That's my thing when I study is, why did he do that? Instead of just going, cool. 
I want to know why he did it. It was a demonstration of God's judgment against the Philistines that Samson was blameless, headed to a refuge city. He was blameless of the Philistine deaths. It was also a prophetic passing of the torch, so to speak, to King David, who would come in and finish the Philistine oppression once and for all. The king comes and finishes it off. Lord Jesus, my king, is coming to finish it off. He already did. He said it's finished. But you can't live under that oppression no more. you got to walk out of it. He gives you a way out. That's why he's called the way. Take him up on it. So now Judges 16 and 4. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies. Or if I say it like the the Bible app I listen to, it would be like this. Entice him. (laughs) Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So look, okay, you can tell how scared the Philistines are of Samson. Now, after his demonstration of strength and judgment against them, they think killing him is going to solve their problem. Uh, they don't know the God they're messing with, do they? They just don't know him. And so apparently Samson's one weakness for women has really gotten around. <laughs> That's, that's the big clincher here. And, and again, we can relate this to ourselves. If you have a sin problem and it gets around and people know about it, boy, I'm telling you, the enemy is really going to use it against you. That's why I talk about repentance so much. Get out of there. Stop doing that. The enemy is going to use it. He's going to own you. So that's getting around that he's easily seduced by women. And so, hey, we got Delilah here. Let's use her. Let's use this lady. And so it was obviously reported Samson was messing around with a prostitute the night he ripped up the gate. He's got this track record, go, record going on. Let's go get Delilah to help out. So the enemy is going to target his weakness. Judges 16 and 6. So Delilah said to, Am- said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn when it took... But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. And you know, it should have stayed that way, actually. (laughs) But the Lord had a plan in this. He had a plan. You ever found yourself in a situation where you got brought down, like the, the direction Samson's headed? The Lord still uses that. He still does. And so Delilah here, her name means devotee, uh, I don't get that, but she was probably a Philistine, maybe, because as we saw here, she's not devoted to anyone except the promise of getting 1,100 pieces of silver. I mean, she's devoted to that. Um, Studies have been done that reveal the possibility uh, of her being a prostitute also. Samson just uh, spent the night with a harlot. She may have been a prostitute also, possibly, which matches up to the character of her using people to make money off of them. And so that's what she's trying to do here is make money off of this, off of her services. That plus the fact that Samson has a desire for prostitutes. Uh, Delilah can't be trusted is basically what I'm trying to say. Whatever she is, she can't be trusted. She's after the money. Oh my gosh, how bad of a problem do we have like that today? People love money. Did you know Jesus says you can't love money and me? You can't love both of us. Pick one, that's it. And and that's a big problem for Americans today because we have so much. Well, she loves money, and we just uh, you you can't trust her. And so you can see how she doesn't trust Samson because she ties him up with seven bowstrings while he slept. Then she tested to see if he was telling the truth or not. She tested what he said by saying, "The Philistines are here. Come on, they're they're in here," just to see what will happen when he wakes up. And so she's testing him to see if he's telling the truth or not. But He snapped it, and so she's going to try it again. Judges 16 and 10. 
Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he told her, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah, therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room, but he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the weave, into the web of the loom. So she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. And so for the first time, Samson he didn't give the secret of his strength away at all by saying, tie my hands. But now he's starting to get a little bit closer to the truth now, isn't he? He's starting to get closer to his hair. He's starting to give. He's starting to, oh, what's the word? He's trying to compromise somewhere in there. Guys, don't compromise to the enemy. Never compromise to the enemy. When God gives you a direct call on your life, you get on that path and you go. And don't let people try to entice you off to the side or just a little bit or halfway. None of it. That's why it's called the narrow way. Get on the road and stay there. He's getting a little closer. He's starting to talk about his hair. Now, we have to remember that Samson is a Nazarite, and his uncut hair was the sign that he was obeying God's command of being a Nazarite. It's a sign of his vow. This wedding ring on my hand is a sign of my vow that I'm married to Anna. That's what this is. Nazarites had long hair as a sign of their vow that they were set apart unto God, and he was keeping himself holy. But what Samson is doing right now, sleeping with prostitutes, that's not very holy, is it? That's not very set apart, is it? He's already compromising his vows. I'm telling you, Samson confuses me. He really does. I can't figure him out. I can't figure myself out either. But holy means set apart and unique. And being holy unto God means you should set yourself apart from the world and be just his. I'm just doing what God says. Oh, come on, Ray, let's go and do No. Oh, goody two-shoes. No, I'm just trying to be set apart unto God. That's all. I'm just trying to be holy. Samson's starting starting to break. And I know a lot of Christians today are starting to break. They're starting to, yeah, okay. And they go off and they start getting themselves in trouble. You see Samson getting close to trouble. Christians, people, at least if you're calling yourself one, stop compromising with the world. Don't do this. Get back on the narrow path and stay there. Well, I'll lose all my friends. Then lose your friends. It's better to be friends with Jesus than try to run with everybody else. But Samson's starting to walk into some dangerous territory here because now he's starting to talk about his hair. And the first two times he spoke about being tied by his hands and he broke them both times, but now he's talking about his hair. This indicates that Samson is starting to abandon his vow. And so Delilah, Delilah, she just nags the tar out of him, doesn't she? I mean, she's really working it. You've lied to me. You've li she's lying to him. She's doing this for money. She's not doing it because she cares about him. There, it, it, you know, I, I've heard somebody say, Ray, you could title this message, Sex, Lies, and Bad Haircuts. <laughs> but I didn't go that way. So she does her little test. She uses a loom to make fabric out of the threads. She does her little test again. The Philistines are here, but he gets up and he breaks loose again. Now, I know what you might be thinking. How could somebody be dumb enough to fall for this time and time and time again? I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. How can anyone fall for the same sin over and over again? How can anybody fall for the same addiction over and over again? Now, can we point our fingers at Samson too much now? We've got to look at ourselves a minute here. He's human like any of us are. He's doing that. Falling for the same sin over and over again? How can, how can someone fall time and time again to something that brings them pleasure even though they know it's not good for them? That's why Samson's doing this. I like this. feels great to me. He knows it's going to get him in trouble. Christian, watch it. That stuff that makes you feel good, it's going to get you. So let's don't point at Samson like he's the only fool. We have all had an addiction to some kind of sinful pleasure at one time or another, and we knew it wasn't good for us, yet we did it over and over again. Some people still doing it. 
always pushing the boundaries closer to danger each time. We have to stop. Judges 16 and 15. Then he said to him, then she said to him, how can you say, I love you? Oh, look at this. She's going for the heart now. How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. Okay, I know this sounds somewhat humorous because I heard a laugh and I'm smiling too. <laughs> and maybe we can laugh a little bit about it, but back to the seriousness of this here. The Bible is dead serious when it talks about persistently nagging women, what it does to people. Ray, why did you look at me? I just scanned the room. That's all I did. That's all I did. I'm going to look at ceiling tiles. Nagging women. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it vexed him to death. And this is no reflection of my wife here, <laughs> but I have been forced to do research on contentious women. We've had contentious women in the body of Christ at times before, and I've had, to, I've had to research what the Bible says about it because they're pastor pesterers, and they're people pesterers, and they just wear everybody down, and it hurts the body of Christ, and ultimately it makes division. It can. It's destructive, and it's damaging. And the bottom line is it is ungodly behavior. It's not good. Proverbs 5 and 3, for the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. To the man hearing that, he's going, whoo, yeah. That's what Samson was thinking. But it's dangerous. And so Delilah is really driven to get that big money that she'd been promised, right? And so she nagged Samson so bad that he was so deeply troubled. Now, you remember, last Sunday I mentioned that the Judeans tried to say, to, they said to Samson, why have you troubled the Philistines? Why have you brought this to the Philistines? Don't you know that they rule over us? Samson, don't you know this is just the way it is? We Israelites are way down here, and the Philistines are way up there, and they just rule over us. That's just how it's supposed to be. Now, stop rocking the boat. That's basically what they told him. And when you submit to oppression like that, because we all have our own oppression today. When you just say, okay, oppression, okay, sin, this is just the way it is. I, yeah, okay, we'll just go with it. When you give oppression power over your life, you lose discernment. You stop hearing from the Lord the way the Lord tells you to go. When you submit to oppression, you lose discernment, the determination of telling what's right from wrong. All your logic and all your reasoning flies right out the window. You lose that. Samson doesn't even know well enough to pack up and get away from this woman. He ought to know. Well, how come he's not? Because he gave himself over to oppression. He is weakened by this, this sin. He wants it. He wants this prostitute. And when you give yourself over to a sin like that, you can't walk around, well, I heard from the Lord. The Lord told me to, the well, wait a minute. What about that sin problem that's dominating your life? Are you sure you're hearing from the Lord? Oh, yeah, I heard that. Test the spirits. Be careful. Samson ought to know to get away from this woman. His desire for self-pleasure has him walking straight into a trap, and it'll do the same for you too. Watch out. Be careful. And so it says that she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. I could say, Samson, get out of there. Leave. He lost his marbles, guys. He's given himself over to sin. That's what sin will do to you. Judges 16, 17. He was vexed to death that he told her all his heart and said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. There you go. You did it now. Have you ever been in that spot, oh, Ray? Now you really did it. You should have got out a long time ago. 
You should have not let this have you. You should have got out and repented and left and run to the Lord quickly, but you didn't and you stayed here. Now it's done. You ever been there? I have. Secrets out now. The Philistines were looking for some magic secret, they were thinking. Samson's hair, his hair was not magical. His long hair was the sign of a Nazarite. It was a symbol. It was an outward display of his vow to be set apart, dedicated to the Lord. This ring is made of plastic. It's one of those squishy rings. I can't wear the metal ones. It's a squishy ring. But there's nothing magical about it. I'm, I'm dedicated to Anna, my wife, but if some girl wants to talk to me and I take it off, Ooh, now I'm in trouble. Now I'm doing something wrong, right? It's not the ring. It's my heart. What's wrong with my heart in the matter? Okay, Samson gave up. He compromised. He said, okay, whatever. I'd rather have my pleasure, my sin. And they found out about his hair. Now he's going to lose the sign of his vow. And, and so the the, the long hair was the sign, is the symbol of an outward display of his inner vow. What is your outward display of your inner vow to the Lord look like? A lot of people say, well, I believe in Jesus, but their outward sign is nothing. Their outward sign is, well, I love Jesus, but I live like the devil. That's baloney. It doesn't add up. Guys, I'm just going to tell you, don't jive with the Word of God. So what is your outward vow, your outward sign showing? And he was supposed to be dedicated to the Lord, and for his dedication, he was enabled with great strength by the Spirit of God. Guys, do you want to walk in great strength of the Spirit of God? Then is your inner vow to the Lord being shown outwardly? That's how you will walk in that strength, not just by saying it and then doing other things. So Samson's about to lose his strength here. Judges 16 and 18 When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money. There you go. That's what I wanted, she's thinking. And brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. Bam, there you go. Now you're in it. And his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. Listen to that. Got a little proud. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. He's right back where he started. They bound him with with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. So he's been put to work. He was put to women's work as a grinder. There were women that would take grain, and they would grind it. That's typically what a woman did. To take this great man that ripped up gates and carried it 40 miles and beat all these guys up, now you're being put to women's work? You don't think that's an insult to a man to have to be done that way? You, you know what the Lord is doing? He's humbling him. I, I always tell people, isn't it better to just go ahead and bow the knee to the Lord now instead of waiting for him to put you through a process? Did you know that we can just do this now without letting it get this bad? I'm asking for people, just bow the knee. Get rid of the sins, walk away from it, repent, get out of it. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, and just get down on your knee. You might save yourself a lot of trouble. Samson had a weakness for women. Now he's doing the work of the women. Samson having a weakness with women. That's something I wanted to say real quick. This, by the way, is the same weakness that most guys still have today. I have seen it ruin entire marriages. I've seen it ruin ministries. I studied under pastors in Bible college that got caught in adultery because of their school email that they were sending back to the the woman they were having an affair with, and they would deny it, but they got caught. And right in the middle of our study, they disappeared and had to be taken out. 
then you know what happened, the ripple effect from there. It goes through their family, it goes through the wife, it goes through their church, and they lose it all overnight. And it was very, very sad, very painful. Even knowing what happened to this man, it hurt us, the students. Guys still have this problem, weakness for women, and it causes them to fall into a trap. And it causes fornication that people bring back into the church that the Bible says don't have none of that in the body of Christ. You cannot. It's not good. And so now look what it's done to Samson. This strong guy that nobody could take down, now he's imprisoned, and he's doing Philistine woman work, and the Philistines gouged his eyes out. I don't know how they did it. Maybe they had a guy that did it with his thumbs, stick. I don't know. That look how bad. I'm not trying to get gory. I'm, saying, I'm trying to indicate what sin will do to you, how damaging it is. It's not fun. Now, one thing you'll notice from here on out is that there is no more mention of Delilah. She didn't come running into the prison. Oh, let Samson out. He's my man. I cared about him. I spent time. She took the money and run, guys. She's out of here. She was engaging in sexual immorality with him. Single guys and gals. I know this kind of thing is your ultimate fantasy here, a kind of a desire to have a friend with benefits. But when you shack up with an immoral person, you're letting your weakness get the better of you, and it's going to end up throwing you into some kind of bondage that will hurt you. That's how it goes. I just ran over 99% of single people in America today. I'm sorry. This is the Word of God. I'm not sorry. This is the Word of God. It's going to end up getting you in trouble. People that do this with you do not love you. They do not love you. Talking through the camera there, anybody, YouTube, whatever that hears me, they don't love you. They will leave you in a heartbeat for the next best thing that shows up, just like Delilah did. I see it time and time again. You would think after thousands of years, we would have this figured out by now. If you're a Christian, prove it and have discernment. If you burn with lust, guys, marry the girl. Put a finger on, a, a ring on her finger and marry the girl. Oh, God gives you permission to do that. He gives you a whole book in the Bible that says, there's your lady, get after it, man. It's biblical, but don't do like this, like with what Samson and Delilah did. Delilah had been nagging at Samson about love. You don't love me, playing that word, lying to him. Don't fall for that. Don't be a fool. She didn't love him at all. Invest your time with someone that proves they have a real love for you by refusing to engage in sexual immorality. Oh, Ray, you're talking about rare stuff. Now, don't you want to find a rare woman? that will not do this, that puts godliness first? If you settle for a girl that will quickly give you what you want to have, Satan is going to quickly give you what he wants you to have. Big trouble. And Samson's trouble is that now he is a blind slave. And we're never going to hear about Delilah ever again. Don't worry, I've got one for the guys coming too. I'm not just woman bashing today. I know y'all are sitting there, okay, I'm not hearing any more of this. I'm leaving. Just, just wait. <laughs> Judges 16, 23. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has delivered into our hands our enemy the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened, when their hearts were merry, they, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women, All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord, God, remember me, I pray, strengthen me, I pray just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. 
And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtel in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. A judge was like a president at the time. He had uh, powers uh, recognized by Israel. Samson wasn't just a guy that went around shaking stuff up. He had uh, somewhat of a political power too. So the Philistine lords had this big party to their god Dagon. These are the same guys that paid Delilah off, by the way. <laughs> and Dagon is a false god that's been mentioned in the Old Testament before. It was an idol that was smashed before the Ark of the Covenant. So the Lord's dealt with Dagon before, <laughs> this false god. He's already taken him down once, just going to do it again. And so we don't know what kind of performing Samson did, but whatever it was, it was to mock him. It was to make fun of you, to make fun of him. And, and people will make fun of you for being a believer. And I know you've been through it. And I know they mocked you while you were alone, and, you, and it makes it feel all the more worse. Don't worry. God has a plan uh, to protect you. It, you can do mighty things still yet. And it was through this, though, that Samson was humbled down enough to regain his discernment. Did you notice that? Samson regained his discernment enough to finally pray to the Lord like he should have done before he was messing with Delilah. Samson once said with pride, I have killed a thousand men, and he often went against his vow. But now he prayed to the Lord, Lord God. He called out, Lord, oh God. Now his discernment is back. Guys, that's what humbling will do to you. And when you get humbled, it doesn't feel good. Now, I made the point about his eyes being gouged out because it had to be tremendously painful, and I know maybe you're going through something very, very painful right now in your life. I don't know what it might be, but guys, this is to get your discernment back. This is to, build, to get your faith back on again. It's to get you to call out to God for things you should have called out to him for for a long time ago. That's the good end of it. James 4 and 6 says, God resists the proud. I have killed a thousand men, but gives grace to the humble. Oh God, this one last time. How good is that? In closing now. There's some things we can learn from Samson, even though he's a confusing guy. But he had great potential, didn't he? He had a lot of potential, a lot of strength. But he played around with sin, and it caused him to forget about his vow being dedicated to the Lord. And sin has a blinding impact on us. It'll blind you from seeing. In Samson's case, it was a literal blindness to show that when you play with sin too much, it's going to cost you more than you're willing to pay for. But perhaps the best lesson we can get out of this is that God would rather forgive than judge. God would rather forgive than judge. Despite all the weaknesses and the mistakes that Samson had made, right at the very, very end, Samson did turn his devotion back to God right before he died. Now, although Samson is confusing, God saw Samson as a man of faith, as a person of faith, and used him to stir up conflict with the Philistines, which would eventually get to the end of the Philistine oppression during Samuel's and David's time 100 years later. The Philistines would eventually disappear from history, leaving behind only the name Palestine as a memory of their existence. And you know, when it comes to confusing people like Samson, <laughs> I have to remember that I have sinned, and I have fallen short of the glory of God. And I have also compromised with my devotion to God many times too. And oftentimes those mistakes will cost us a lot. But some of you are thinking here today that you've messed up too much already. You've already blown it too bad to be of any use to the kingdom of God at all. I, I remember what I did, this thing that I have in my past. I just, for some reason, you can't shake it. You can't just let it go. It, 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 you think you, you say you have, but for some reason it's still there, and it has stopped you. It has limited you from doing things that God has called you to do. 
Just remember how powerful Samson was, not on his own strength, but when the Holy Spirit of God, when the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. It's not dependent on you. It's not dependent on what you can do. Yes, I messed up. Yes, I have this big mistake in my life. Okay, let's be forgiven and march on. But it's not by your strength that it is going to be where God does great things. It's by his strength. We have to remember that. It's under the power of the Lord. Colossians 1 and 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful. Do you see that? You can be fruitful, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Guys, being fruitful and increasing in the knowledge of God run together. Increasing in the knowledge of God and being fruitful goes together. Peas and carrots. This might, the might comes from God's power, not yours, but don't be foolish playing around with sin. That's where you lose your discernment and your knowledge, like Samson did. Now, Colossians says the prerequisite to receiving this power is for us to increase in our knowledge of God. How much do you read the Bible? How much, I'm talking in your own time, not just, well, I hear you on Sunday, Ray, that's not enough. Do you eat once a week? I hope you're eating Monday through Saturday. If not, you're going to be dead time you get here. You got to keep feeding yourself spiritually all the time. Too many Christians are not reading God's word. You don't know the first thing. When I was teaching college kids a long time ago, I said, well, you remember that part in the Bible? They said, no. I said, well, you remember this part in the Bible? No. They didn't know. I said, have you ever read the Bible? Oh, no. Have you ever read a, the, the book of John? No. Have you ever read one chapter of the Bible? No. They hadn't read anything, but they're proclaiming a king they don't even know. Knowledge of God comes with hearing God's word. Builds the faith, Matthew 22 and 29. See, Samson didn't have discernment. I want us to have that. That's what I'm trying to do here. Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. I want you to have the power of God in your life. We saw what Samson did and how cool it was, okay? And he did great things, but he also messed up a lot. And he, you could see he loses marbles, his discernment. At sometimes then he had to be humbled to get it back. I don't want you to have to go through a humbling process. Why not just bow the knee now? But to do that, you've got to know who you're repenting with. You've got to know who you're asking forgiveness from. That comes with getting knowledge of the Lord. And that comes with hearing the Word of God. So thank you all for being here today. If you don't know the Scriptures, you do not know God. I will say that again because some people argue that. If you don't know the Scriptures, you don't know God. Well, I'm saved. I if you don't know the Scriptures, you don't know God. Samson is not the only one that has known power from God. You can too. You can too. And as incredible as it was for him to carry that gate as far as he did, for the reason he did, God is waiting to unleash power in your life to do things you never thought you could do either. And I want to help you get there. I want to help you get there. That's why it's important to be in the body of Christ where there is many, where it's harder to break. And hearing the word preached, hearing it, reading it all the time, as well as being devoted in your own Bible study. You do that, you will know the word of God, you will know the power of God, and you can walk with discernment to do great things with the power of God in your life. And you'll be able to more easily determine sin from goodness and you can get away from that sin samson you should have got away from delilah well he was stupid at that time he didn't have it he was enticed don't be enticed i gave you the formula to walk in god's power